I hope everyone's managed to stay healthy during this virus crisis and I appreciate David Mandy and O&M inviting me back on here. And I, I thought this time, I thought I would talk about jurisdiction slash political risk in connection with mining stocks. I, I, think, I think a lot of times, I know myself, I used to be somewhat dismissive of it, you know, kind of in a cavalier way. And after being burned a couple of times, I've, I've come to reverse my thinking on it, you know, being burned a couple of times over the, over the years. And um, I think a lot of people, when they think about jurisdictional or political risk, they think about, you know, the possibility of maybe the government, the federal government starting to seize the mines. And <clears throat> I actually had gotten that question from one of my subscribers last week about, you know, whether or not I thought at some point, the United States might seize the gold mines in the United States in order to have a source of gold. And honestly, I, I don't think just because of the official policy of, of the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve toward gold, that it's a useless asset or it's not money. I, I don't think that that's really a risk that I'm concerned with. And if, if we get to the point where the government starts seizing mines, I think we have bigger problems to worry about and whether or not, you know, our favorite stock just had its mind seized. So um, I'm going to kind of focus on some sources of risk that um, I've been burned by a couple times. Um, obviously, there's, you know, the, the risk of the environmental risk of not getting permits. And I think that's probably, by my way of thinking, that's probably the biggest risk in the United States, and, and it varies from state to state. Um, but the sources of risk that have, that have uh, kind of come up and bit me in the behind are, are more related to um, local political jurisdictions in, in some of these foreign countries versus you know, the sovereign government um, sources of risk. And I've got just three quick cases that I'll, that I'll go over to, you know, so I can kind of use them for illustrative purposes. And the names that I mentioned in here, I'm not endorsing and I'm not not endorsing. I'm just, I'm using them kind of as placeholders to illustrate the situation. And um, in case one, I, I actually got kind of lucky. Uh, many of you might remember Aqualine Resources and I personally had, had made a big investment in it and we it was the largest to date, the largest investment on a, on a percentage allocation wise that we ever have had in my fund, Aqualine uh, was advancing a 700 million ounce silver resource in, in Southern Argentina in a province called Chibut. Now on the surface, it sounds great. And it, it, at the time it was uh, one of the largest undeveloped silver resources in the world. And I of course was enticed by the idea that it's a huge silver resource and Price of silver was starting to get jiggy, and I figured, oh, this one's this one's a no-brainer. Well, in in a sense, there there was a problem, and that was the province of Chibut prohibits the use of cyanide in in the mining process. And um, I, I kind of again, I was kind of dismissive of that because I figured, well, you know what, um, this this province has high unemployment and they're going to want the jobs when a mine is built here. And the reason why I say I got lucky is that uh, Pan American Silver in, I think it was November 2009, acquired Aqualine for 626 million Canadian. And at the time when they acquired it, they were confident that they'd be able to get the, the cyanide restriction reversed. Well, 11 years later, and the project is still on care and maintenance, and it's, it costs it cost Pan American some money every year to, to, to maintain it and to, and to maintain its right, its mining rights on the property. So that was, that was a situation where I got kind of lucky. And then of course, you know, being, being greedy and, and stubborn, I, I kind of um, got, went beyond that. And the case two was, um, was a lot of you probably remember Tahoe or were invested in it. And I had a, a position in my fund and um, I was also strongly endorsing it in my mining stock journal. And the Escobar mine, I think it was putting out somewhere between four and 5 million ounces of silver a year. It was one of the larger 
silver um, primary source silver producing mines in the world um, is a meaningful percentage of Guatemala's GDP. And, and you would look at that and say, oh, well, you know, I'm not, you know, the, the political situation in Guatemala may be tenuous, but I don't think they're going to do anything to, to harm the, the economic advantages of having this mine operated. Well, what happened is, is that some environmentalists that I believe they were U.S. based went down there and they found a couple indigenous peoples to attack the Escobar mine in what they call the Supreme Court down there. The Supreme Court level is kind of the equivalent of a, of a federal court up here. And what they challenged was, was um, they said that the Ministry of Engineering and Mining, the MEM, did not comply with International Labor Order 169. Now, some of you or maybe all of you have heard of that or maybe you hadn't. I had not heard of that until this situation. And it's, it's, a, it's a UN supported directive <laughs> that requires that in countries with, with indigenous peoples or, or tribal peoples that if a company wants to put up a mine, they have to go through this consultation process and get everyone on board with it. Now, um, Ron Clayton, who was the CEO of Tahoe at the time, assured me that that uh, Tahoe had gone beyond the the standards set by IL 169 in, in doing their their um, community consultations, um, but the Supreme Court saw otherwise, and the suit itself wasn't against Tahoe; it was against the Ministry of Engineering and Mining. And the effect of the suit was that it ultimately um, caused the suspension of, of Tahoe's operating license. And, you know, I, I thought for sure that at some point this situation was going to be reversed, that the um, Constitutional Court in, in Guatemala would reverse it, reverse the Supreme Court decision. And it, it just was not happening. And it, this thing was like, you know, it was basically in suspended animation. Well, Pan American Silver acquired Tahoe also because Tahoe also had some, some very attractive gold assets in Canada and, and, and some other attractive um, development assets. And they acquired Tahoe for 1.1 billion. And, um, you know, again, we took a loss on our stock in my fund and it, you know, it was at a lower price than I had originally recommended the stock in my mining stock journal. Um, but part of the deal was was Pan American didn't want to pay full value for Escobar, understandably, and and um, so they also issued a contingent value right that had a 10-year expiration, and if it was ever exercised, it, it had a face value of about two point about 221 million dollars. So it would it would essentially let Tahoe shareholders participate. In the reopening of the of the Escobar mine, if it ever reopened, well, <laughs> fast forward to today, and the situation is still in suspended animation, and who knows if that mine will ever reopen. Um, and and so um, that was that was kind of the second case where it wasn't a complete disaster for me, but um, I, I certainly got burned by political and jurisdictional risk that that I I didn't see coming or I didn't understand. Um, or understand the risks of. And then the third case is, real quickly, um, some of you or all of you may know about GoldQuest. GoldQuest has um, its Romero project in the Dominican Republic, and it's in the San Juan province. And it has a 2.3 million ounce gold resource, and there's a PFS that's been done on it that values the project at 203 million. And, um, you know, this, when I started looking at this, I started looking at it in connection with my interest in precipitate gold, and um, I said, "Well, geez, this 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 stock seems very cheap relative to, um, you know, the potential value of this mine, especially if we start getting a higher price of gold." And my second thought was, you know, I don't I don't know how the Dominican Republic can have a lot of political um, risk given that Pueblo Viejo mine is there, that Barrick operated at the time with Gold Corp and now with Newmont, and it's one of the largest gold mines in the world. So on the surface, uh, the DR is an extremely 
politically friendly jurisdiction for mining companies. Well, once again, um, I kind of got bit in the butt by a local court situation. The, the, the local court in San Juan issued an injunction that, that basically blocked Gold Quest's ability to get an exploitation license as opposed to an exploration license. And the ex exploitation license is the license that would allow them to advance the project to mine construction and, and exploit the, the land for, for profits. Well, to kind of cut to the chase here, um, the, the president of the Dominican Republic um, has the ability to award Gold Quest the exploita exploitation license, you know, and go over the, the, the court decision on this matter. Um, but for political purposes within this particular province, the president doesn't really want to touch it, or it seems up to this point doesn't want to touch it. And again, this situation is, is still in suspended animation. Who knows if it'll ever be resolved in favor of, of Gold Quest being able to continue the advancement of the mine. Um, but the long and the short of it is, is, is the stock is trading at probably about 50% of where it was when I originally recommended the, the stock in my mining stock journal. And, um, and also, uh, about 50% below where we had originally bought it in my fund. We we no longer own own the stock because I just I don't want to you know if, if they ever get the exploitation exploitation license then you know I'll I'll repurchase the stock because I think it's a it's a very attractive project. So um, that that's kind of my thoughts on political and jurisdictional risk um, and I I still. You know, these situations have kind of, um, it makes me look a lot harder at, at whether I'll, I'll look at projects, ex exploration projects, or mining company investments in kind of the more politically risky jurisdictions. And that doesn't mean I won't look at them at all. I'll look at anything if I think that there's potential for the reward to outweigh the risk. But um, it, it, it certainly, <laughs> I mean, I've been doing this sector since 2001, and and um, in the last, really over the last five to eight years, I've, I've reassessed how I evaluate political risk, and 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 I've reassessed my willingness to take risk on political risk. So, um, that's it for for my presentation on on political risk, and I look forward to getting the update on pure gold mining. I've covered and been invested in pure gold mining since the middle of 2016. And um, to this day, I still think it's it's um, undervalued relative to the intrinsic value of, of what'll eventually be an operating mine there. So thank you for your time. <laughs>